Hello everyone. There are seemingly two different creation narratives in the book of Genesis. According to the first narrative, it took God six days to create heaven and the earth, light and darkness, seas and rivers, sun, moon and stars, plants and animals, and finally man and woman in his own image. And on the seventh day, he rested. In today's first reading, we take the second narrative, which seems to suggest that God created everything in a short period of time, and after creating heaven and the earth, and before any grass or shrubs had sprouted from the earth, God made man. Friends, it is written, The Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground, and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and so man became a living being. That is to say, like a porter shapes an earthen vessel, God formed man from the very clay or dust of the ground, and he breathed his own breath of life into man. This distinguishes man from all of God's other creatures. Man is more than the dust or physical substance that he is made of. He has his spirit. He has the very breath of God to sustain him. Thus, with the breath of God in him, man became a living being with a living soul. The Lord God then fashioned a garden and caused all kinds of trees to grow in it. And he placed the man there. The garden was solely for the man's comfort and enjoyment. It was a place of peace and beauty, where food and water was abundant. There were two important trees in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God gave the man freedom to eat all the fruits of the garden except the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Then God created animals and birds from which man could choose a companion. Since no animal was suitable as a partner for man, God made a woman out of a rib of the man to be his partner. Friends, then we read how the man and the woman were tempted to disobey God. It is said, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord had made. The serpent asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? Friends, serpents or snakes are not evil creatures. The serpent here mentioned in the text is merely a symbolic representation of evil or Satan because of its cunningness. The conversation between the woman and the serpent reveals Satan's deviousness. The serpent carefully twisted what God had said by putting a seemingly innocent question to the woman. God had told them, You may eat of every tree in the garden, but not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the serpent asked her, Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? Friends, with this question, the serpent covered up his intent to deceive the woman and thus led her to doubt God. He gave her the impression that God was not really that good to them. God had given them freedom to eat from every tree in the garden, but placed only one restriction on them. God's permissions to them far exceeded his restriction. But the serpent made it sound as if God had permitted nothing and restricted them on everything. Thus, the serpent deliberately distorted God's goodness. Friends, then the serpent went much further by exaggerating that God's command is attributed to his own selfish motives. God had told the man, you shall not eat it or even touch it, lest you die. But the serpent blatantly contradicted God's word and said to the woman, You certainly will not die, no. God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is bad. Friends, he beguiled the woman by saying that God had put the restriction not for the welfare, 
but to prevent them from becoming godlike, knowledgeable and powerful. The woman listened to the lies of the serpent and finally gave in. She ate the fruit from the forbidden tree, which she then shared with the man. She invited the man to join in her disobedience, which he did. Now the fallen woman had become a temptress herself. Friends, after doing so, they did not die immediately, but were made subject to death and eventually died. Their eyes were open, but not in the way they had anticipated. They were now aware of things they were not aware of before. They were aware of being naked and were ashamed and were filled with the guilt for what they had done. They became a little like God in knowing good and evil, but not in the way they had expected. Friends, what does the tree of knowledge of good and evil mean? The tree of knowledge of good and evil refers to the ability to tell right from wrong, to make judgments and decisions on one's own behalf. God had made human beings in his likeness, but placed a limit on them. He wanted to keep the knowledge of good and evil to himself. They could know many things, but God the Creator alone had the power to decide what is best for them. God himself is the ultimate source of what is right and wrong. But human beings overstepped the limit imposed by God and appropriated that knowledge. Henceforth, they had to make choices and decisions on their own, but without the wisdom and vision of the Creator. In other words, by eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, man had taken upon himself the role of a judge of what is good and evil. Friends, what do we learn from this Genesis account of creation? 1. There have been many debates and much controversy going on for many years about the creation story in the Bible. This is because, first of all, it appears there are two accounts written at very different times by different people. However, it has been pointed out that they do not contradict each other, on the contrary, they complement each other. Secondly, most scientists say that the creation theory in the scriptures is false, unscientific and improbable and the evolution theory is much more practical, logical and probable. Friends, we by no means need to debate over these differences. What is important and definitely fundamental to our Christian faith is that we believe God created heaven and the earth and the universe. Any belief that undermines, belittles or weakens the biblical doctrine of creation thereby undermines, belittles or weakens our faith in the existence and nature of God and the Bible as God's word. From the biblical account of creation, we learn the following. 1. Going back to our roots in the book of Genesis, we realize that just dust is what we started out as and dust is what we end up one day. But the breath of God, which is called the soul, would be alive. The soul is the most important thing that sets man apart from animals and the rest of creation. It allows us to live even after we die. It is the soul that appears before the throne of God. It is to redeem this soul which is corrupted by sin that Jesus came. Friends, Lent is an opportunity to cleanse our souls, restore our hearts and strengthen our spirit with the breath of God. 2. Everything that man needed to live life to the full was in the garden. There was not any external internal threat to man's life. His life was innocent. He knew no pride, anger, guilt, malice or vanity. He was satisfied. He was safe. He felt no opposition from within or outside. His life was without pain, worry, fear, sickness or sin. He lived a perfect life of peace, ease and the satisfaction of having his basic needs met. 
God provided him all this. But then he lost all of it because of his disobedience. So also, as long as we are in the garden where God has placed us, we will feel safe, content and peaceful. 3. The conversation between the serpent and the woman is still used by Satan to tempt and ensnare us today. Friends, he began the temptation with a question. Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? His question insinuated that God had the ulterior motive or a hidden agenda for forbidding the man and the woman from eating from the tree of knowledge. It was to make them doubt God's word or question what God had said. Our temptations also usually come in the form of questions about things in the Bible. Sometimes it is factual questions such as, did Jesus really walk on the water? Or other times it is doctrinal questions such as, do you really believe that Mary, a virgin, really conceived the child within her by the Holy Spirit? Or moral questions such as, where in the Bible does it specifically say premarital sex is wrong? Friends, if such questions are raised out of a sincere desire to know the truth, then it is fine. But oftentimes such questions are asked to throw us into doubt and confusion, with no real desire for the truth. Many questions were asked of Jesus in this way. Friends, as Christians, it is important that we are fully aware of Satan's evil plans and hold on to the word of God even if circumstances seem to contradict it. We must resist the voice of Satan, constantly questioning and challenging us. We must never allow any negative thinking of God's word to creep into our mind. 4. The woman's greatest mistake was that she readily allowed herself to engage in conversation with the serpent. Satan took control of her once she started speaking to him. Friends, learning from the mistakes of Eve, we must heed the Apostle Paul's counsel and not to give the devil a chance. To be safe, we need to shy away from talking to the tempter. If not, it only gives Satan a foothold in our lives. He will continue to misrepresent or distort God's word to plant a seed of doubt in our mind and confuse us. Friends, the only way to resist the devil is to quote God's word like Jesus did during his temptation. We must say to the enemy, it is written in the scriptures. Satan wanted to conquer the Son of God. But when he became fully conscious that there was no possibility of taking control over Jesus, Satan left him alone. So, as the apostles Peter and James tell us, if we give in to God, stand firm in the faith and resist the devil, he will run away from us. 5. Friends, finally, the woman gave in to the lust of the flesh saying the fruit was good for food, nice to look at and also desirable, the woman took a bite out of it. She also gave some to the man to eat. After they had eaten it, they became ashamed and realized that they were naked, they felt guilty and covered themselves with the fig leaves. Friends, we are reminded today that temptation is all around us testing us as even Jesus was tested. No one is about temptation or the potential to sin. Temptation comes in many forms, often through those near and around us. When we give in to temptation and sin, we often have to pay a high price. We lose our freedom, dignity, honor, peace and joy. Therefore, let us not allow ourselves to be seduced into falling into the many traps that Satan lays for us. Amen. God bless you.